Things are getting spicy at the royal palace. The king is back from Greece and is ready to look for a new wife. Women are being taken from all around the kingdom and brought to the palace to see which one will please the king the most and which one he will choose to set the royal crown on. So grab your Bible and your favorite drink and let's dig into the second chapter of the book of Esther. <laughs> What's up ladies? Welcome to Her Journey with God. I'm Sarah and today we're digging into the second chapter of the book of Esther and what an interesting story it's been so far. We see King Hasuerus or King Xerxes depending on the translation you have. He was throwing this giant feast and showing off the glory of his kingdom. He was about to invade Greece. Now he's back in town and he is looking for a new wife. And so that is where chapter two picks up today. So let's jump in. After these things, when the anger of King Ahasuerus had abated, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what had been decreed against her. Then the king's young men who attended him said, Let beautiful young virgins be sought out for the king, and let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom to gather all the beautiful young virgins to the harem in Susa the citadel, under custody of Haggai, the king's eunuch who is in charge of women. Let their cosmetics be given to them, and let the young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. This pleased the king, and he did so. So the idea here is that his officials are being appointed to go into all the kingdom. And in the last chapter, we saw that this king was ruler over 127 provinces. And so this is such a large amount of area where young virgins are being gathered. For several years, I worked in TV production. I worked on a dating show and other various reactions reality shows. For those shows, women were applying for the job. They were applying. They were sending out applications and doing casting videos, and they wanted the position. Here in the story of Esther, we see women being gathered from all over the kingdom to see who will please the king. And why wouldn't the king be pleased by this? He's getting all of the prettiest young virgins of the kingdom, so he's got the widest selection. Verse 5, Now there was a Jew in Susa the citadel, whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, son of Shimei, son of Kish, a Benjamite, who had been carried away from Jerusalem among the captives carried away with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away. So if you remember from the introduction and first chapter, this story takes place after the Babylonian captivity and the Babylonian captivity lasted for 70 years and plus there's time after that captivity that exile until the story begins so it's quite unlikely that Mordecai himself was carried away in the exile because he would be so old at this point in the story. And so as I've researched and found commentaries, it looks like it's most likely what the intended meaning of this is, is that his grandparents or great-grandparents were the ones carried away into that exile. And here we find him many years later still living in the land where his ancestors were brought into captivity. Verse 7, he was bringing up Hadassah, that is Esther, the daughter of his uncle, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman had a beautiful figure and was lovely to look at. And when her father and her mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. So Mordecai here appears to be Esther's older cousin who is taking care of this young woman who in some turn of events lost both of her parents. We don't know much more about Esther than this, which is that she was orphaned, she was a Jew, and that her Hebrew name was Hadassah, which means myrtle, like the myrtle tree, the beautiful strong myrtle tree. And Esther probably would have been her Persian name, which means star. So we don't know exactly 
correctly, if Mordecai and Esther chose to change her name from Hadassah to Esther as part of keeping her identity secret, or if it was a name given to her similar to the new name that Daniel was given. Daniel was given a new name, Belteshazzar, and Daniel was his Hebrew name, but Belteshazzar was the Babylonian name that was forced upon him. And so here we see Hadassah also being given a name, Esther. But because Esther wasn't taken into captivity like Daniel was, she rather was born in the area after that captivity, it's more likely that she changed her name to cover up her identity as being a Jewish woman. Verse 8, So when the king's order and his edict were proclaimed, and when many young women were gathered in Susa the citadel in custody of Haggai, Esther also was taken into the king's palace and put in custody of Haggai, who had charge of the women. Since this was the king's order, we don't really know if Esther applied for this or not, and it seems that it wasn't optional for her. And so she's being put in the custody of this, this guy named Haggai, who was in charge of all the women being brought to the province. Verse 9, And the young woman pleased him and won his favor, the favor of Haggai. And he quickly provided her with her cosmetics and her portion of food, and with seven chosen young women from the king's palace, and advanced her and her young women to the best place in the harem. Esther had not made known her people or kindred, for Mordecai had commanded her not to make it known. We don't know exactly why Mordecai told Esther to keep her faith in God and her Jewish heritage quiet. We're not really sure why that happened, but what I find interesting as I'm reading through this passage is that even though Esther was keeping her faith quiet, she was gaining favor just in her character and the way that she presented herself and her integrity. There were qualities that she had about her that caused her to be favored above all the other women in Haggai's presence. He favored her above the others. And this is interesting because often as Christians, we think we need to be talking about Jesus all the time and telling people all about Jesus. But what we should really be thinking about is how our character and how our lives speak for Christ in itself. How does our character and our integrity reflect our faith in God and our faith in Jesus? And for this young woman, it seems that her character spoke very very loudly about her faith, even without saying anything about God. Not that we shouldn't preach the gospel. We should always be ready to give an answer for the, the hope that is in us. But for Esther, it seems that her character shined like a light. Even though she wasn't often talking about her faith, it was very evident that she was different than the other women. From my experience of working on a dating show, I know that behind the scenes in that kind of environment, women can be really catty and competitive and, and have a really bad attitude. But here we see Esther setting herself apart. Something we also start to see about Esther in this passage is that she is very obedient to the God-given authority in her life, which is Mordecai. See, Esther didn't have parents, but she did have Mordecai, this older cousin in her life, who chose to raise her after her parents died. And so we see already that Esther, as a young woman, is being obedient to that authority in her life. Whereas Mordecai told her, don't talk about your faith. Don't make it known that you are a Jew. Keep that quiet for now. And so we see Esther being obedient and listening to that authority in her life. Verse 11, And every day Mordecai walked in front of the court of the harem to learn how Esther was and what was happening to her. And we see Mordecai's concern for Esther. He didn't just say, okay, you're an adult now. Good luck. Uh, God bless. Um, he's very interested to know how Esther is doing. And so he's often checking on her. Verse 12. Now when the turn came for each young woman to go into King Ahasuerus, after being 12 months under the regulations for the women since this was the regular period of their beautifying, six months with oil of myrrh and six months with spices and ointments for women. When the young woman went into the king in this way, she was given whatever she desired to take with her from the harem to the king's palace. In the evening she would go in, and in the morning she would return to the second harem in custody of Shashkaz, the king's eunuch who was in charge of the concubines. She would not go in to the king again unless the king delighted in her and she was summoned by name. 
When the turn came for Esther, the daughter of Abihail, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as his own daughter, to go into the king, she asked for nothing except what Haggai, the king's eunuch who had charge of the women, advised. Now Esther was winning favor in the eyes of all who saw her. So here we see Esther setting herself apart from the other young women yet again as she is listening to the advice of Haggai. She's asking him, what do you suggest that I take? Maybe she said something like, you know the king. What does he like? What do you suggest that I take? Should I wear this yellow dress or this purple one? Should I take the gold jewelry or the silver? What do you suggest that I take? And so Esther is a wise young woman to be listening to the input of other wise people, the rulers around her. And so we see her setting herself apart from the other young women yet again. In 1901, a tomb was discovered near the palace and was dated to the time of Esther. In that tomb, there were various jewels. There were various necklaces and crowns. And so here's just a few pictures of some of the jewelry within that tomb. This was from the time period of Esther and possibly belonged to Esther. We don't know if it was Esther's or not, but it's interesting to see the style of jewelry from that time. So when Esther would have been allowed to take anything from the harem into see the king, she might possibly have taken some jewelry that might have looked something like this. Something we can bring up here is that she went in to spend the night with the king. And so she, it seems, went and had sexual relations with the king, probably by force, but we don't really know that fact, uh, whether or not she willingly did it or whether or not she was forced to do it. But it almost seems like Esther is doing it willingly because of how submissive she was to Haggai and how quickly she was to be obedient. Verse 16, And when Esther was taken to King Ahasuerus into his royal palace in the tenth month, which is the month of Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign, and so we saw in the first chapter that the feast the king was presenting, that was in the third year of his reign. And so now we're seeing these events take place in the seventh year of his reign. So about four years has passed from the beginning of the first chapter of Esther until now. Verse 17, the king loved Esther more than all the women, and she won grace and favor in his sight, more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Then the king gave a great feast for all his officials and servants. It was Esther's feast. He also granted a remission to taxes for the provinces and gave gifts with royal generosity. Now when the virgins were gathered together the second time, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. Here's a picture of where the foundations of that gate were. Esther had not made known her kindred or her people, as Mordecai had commanded her, for Esther obeyed Mordecai just as when she was brought up by him. In those days, as Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Bigthan and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs, who guarded the threshold, became angry and sought to lay hands on King Hazoeris. And this came to the knowledge of Mordecai, and he told it to Queen Esther. And Esther told the king in the name of Mordecai. When the affair was investigated and found to be so, the men were both hanged on the gallows, and it was recorded in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. Wow, what an interesting second chapter of the book of Esther. Things are definitely a little crazy for Esther, this orphan Jewish woman who is being brought up in a land that her ancestors never intended to live in. Esther is being brought up in the land of captivity of her ancestors. It's all she knows. She's probably never been to Jerusalem. She's probably um, doesn't even know much about it. All she knows is this foreign land that she's growing up in without parents parents and trying to live out her faith in the best way that she knows how and is apparently keeping her faith quiet in a land that may not be hospitable to her faith. And so she's living it out in the best way that she knows how. And so we're going to get to see more about how her faith plays out. And if we can just stop and think a minute about the sovereignty and providence of God, that God knows all things and he is in control of all things, He whether he allows 
allows it or whether he does it, whether he changes it or lets it happen. Everything is in God's control. He has the power to do whatever he wants. And just think about the foreknowledge of God to know that this young woman, Esther, would be born in the land where her ancestors were in captivity and that she would live right by the citadel where one day Queen Vashti would not submit to her husband and where the king would choose to have a different wife and that Esther was beautiful. She was a young woman at just the right time. And so I just know that God knew in advance all the details of Esther's life about where she would be born, that she wouldn't have parents, but rather would have Mordecai, who would be her her father figure, her mentor throughout this process, that um, her age would be right, that she would have been a virgin, and that she would have the character that would gain favor with those around her that would promote her to this royal position. And I just know that God knew all of those details in advance and as believers in Christ and as children of God we can trust that God knows all of those details about our lives as well he knows the day we were born he knew us before we were born he knew who our parents would be he knew the situation that we would grow up in whatever it is God knows exactly those details he knows every day of our lives every detail every situation and nothing is overlooked by him and so we know that everything that God allows is in his plan and he's working it out for good and that no matter what our story is whether we're orphans like Esther was or or whether we had some difficult situation in our childhood God can turn everything for good God can weave all of those details of our story together for good Romans 8:28 is for us And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. And so we can trust that as we put our faith in him, God is working all of the details of our story together for good. And so friends, I hope this was encouraging and I can't wait to meet you right back here to take a look at the third chapter of Esther. God bless you. (laughs) 